Hello, it's Reija and welcome to another video. You know, after February I was like, oh my god, I read so many things. Yay, I read like 10 things. And then I was like, oh shit, I am gonna have to talk about all those things, aren't I? So basically what that means is that yes, I've been procrastinating with my wrap-up, so... Uh, Surprise! Late wrap-up! Whee! Let's get started. So my reading in February was pretty evenly split between uh, graphic novels and uh, novels. So I'm first going to be talking about all the comics and manga that I read, and then I'm going to be talking about all of the books that I read. So starting with, I read um, Heathen by Natasha Alterici. This was recommended to me by Jenna, and I am sorry, Jenna, that I did not like the comic book that you recommended, but um, I wasn't a big fan of Heathen. Uh, Heathen is a Viking-inspired story about a lesbian warrior who wants to essentially save uh, the cursed Brunhilde, who is cursed to uh, live her days um, in exile on this mountain and uh, until, uh, until someone saves her and marries her and she can only marry a mortal man. And uh, Idis, the main character, wants to rescue her from this uh, fate and break the curse. Why? Not really clear, she just wants to do it. And uh, I just felt that this first volume didn't really manage to clue me in why I should care about Idis's journey to save Brunhilde. Like, Idis just seems to want to save her because she wants to. She doesn't really have... Uh, driving force behind it. it. It isn't really clear when she even got this idea in her head. And, uh, and uh, yeah. So the story basically follows her um, saving Brunhilde and then things ensue. It's not as clear-cut as to how the curse can be broken. So about the art, I hated it. The art is ugly, in my opinion. It, it To me, the art looks like someone sketched uh, something on Photoshop and then submitted the sketch layer as the final product. Uh, it doesn't look finished. Uh, the characters all look like they've been made from the same template. Everyone looks the same, no matter uh, if they're men, women, they, everyone looks identical. And also, can we just stop with the bikini armor? Like, sometimes a bikini armor can be fun, you know? I'm, I'm, like, I have read my fair share of Red Sonia and enjoyed it. But in this, there are Vikings in Nordic climate. And everyone else is sensibly dressed, but but the women. Why? It looks so stupid. You see these hulking male warriors in their halberds and uh, and uh, chain mail and long cloaks, and then you have the female characters prancing around in leather bikinis next to them in the snow. And I'm here like, um, yeah, that's my suspension of disbelief gone right there. Uh, yeah, uh, I did not enjoy Heathen. I gave it two stars for the effort, and I am not going to continue on with the series. <laughs> Next, I read The Promised Neverland volumes 14 and 15 by Kayu Shirai and illustrated by Posuka Demisu, uh, translated from Japanese by Satsuki Yamashita. And <sighs> this is hard for me because I have really 
liked The Promised Neverland. I am... Like, the plotting, the uh, the mystery elements, everything, like, the story is so good. And um, the art has been a bit of a hit and miss for me in the past, but at least Pozuka Demisu has a really distinct art style that can't really be... Like, when you when you see their art style, you like when you see their art, you immediately know that it's them. So it's very like unique in that sense. And this this latest volumes just haven't been up to par. It's like it's like Kayu Shirai, the writer, has decided that okay, I want to just quickly be done with this series. So the pacing is completely off, like everything is going on too fast and major story elements that could have been explored on page happen off page. And I'm just like, no, this is something that could have been used to really develop these characters and you are choosing to just say, oh, this happened. No, let me see it. So... I ended up giving uh, each of these volumes three stars. Um, I'm still liking the series. Uh, these volumes explored some interesting uh, moral dilemmas, especially this idea of uh, th- this idea of who gets to decide between life and death, and and like what is evil, and if. Um, yeah, there, there are some interesting moral and ethical questions explored in this, but it's just hampered down by the sheer velocity at which this series is going forward. It's like a fright train. So, yeah, uh, three stars uh, to both of these volumes. Then I read Invisible Kingdom, Volume 1 by G. Willow Wilson and Christian Ward. And um, I picked this up because I've had... Many of my friends, for example, Rachel from Kalanadi and Shannon from That's So Po, that have really liked uh, the series. And I was like, oh yeah, space nuns, space Amazon, I, I want to get in on this ride. And it was okay. It was, it was okay. Like, I'm going to continue on with the series, but this first volume didn't really wow me the same way that I feel like some of my friends have been wowed. So, basically, uh, what this series is, is that there is this big corporate entity um, that's basically Amazon in space, and they are controlling all of the, like, goods and sundries and deliveries in this, like... um, so little solar system that's like I think five five planets that's uh, that are pretty cl- in clo- that are in pretty close proximity to each other, and then there is this huge religious organization that is publicly denouncing um, this uh, space corporation and uh, basically judging people for materialism and and uh, begging them to. Um, denounce materialism and uh, life that's all about um, getting more goods and and uh, uh, and getting to face like spirituality and giving themselves to like uh, religion essentially. So they are preaching against this corporate entity and separate of each other. A uh, delivery runner for the company and a nun in service of the religion discover some ties between the corporation and this religious order that basically would jeopardize the balance in the solar system. You know, and they cross paths and they also are being chased by both the religious order and the corporation because they don't want this uh they don't want this secret coming out and you know it was it was okay like i feel like the first volume 
was pretty good at getting the main point of the plot across. Like it introduces us, like it introduces the reader to the main players of the story, and it's like, okay, here are the main characters, here is the plot, and here are all the pieces that you need to know going forward. However, I feel like uh, I didn't really get to know much about the characters, so. What happens is that before I even know who the characters are, what makes them tick, what kind of people they are, uh, I was already thrust into the thick of the plot, uh, which is like mm, not my preferred way of engaging with a story. Like I tend to, I tend to like that there is some peace and uh, some establishing. Uh, character work before we get plunged into the conflict, you know? I like that there is some calm to be shattered, because that kind of makes me go, oh, oh, so we are in the thick of things now. Uh, but now I didn't really get the calm, it was just, okay, here's the conflict, before I'm even really fully aware of what the world is like. But uh, I'm still intrigued. The art was... I like the color palette. I really love the color palette. It's very cyberpunky, very vapor wavy, and um, I really like the uh, lush color palette. But I'm not that big of a fan of the way uh, the characters are drawn. If that makes sense, like I, I feel like sometimes mm, because the artist is going to um going for this very digital painterly uh, thick lines and uh, thick blobs of color sort of art style, I sometimes feel that it can look a bit sloppy. And, uh, and, and sometimes the way the panels are laid out and the way the art flows means that there are some panels that look amazing and then some panels that are maybe a bit rushed. So it's a mixed bag. Like there is a lot of good to be had here. I'm intrigued, but also I'm like, mm, I'm, 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 I'm not as keen on it yet as other people have been. A bit of a mixed bag, three and a half stars. I am interested in picking up more of the series, but I'm not loving it yet. And the last comic that I read was a manga by Tatsuya Endo called Spy X Family um, Volume 1, and this was a lot of fun. Um, I, I think that uh, this is... this has the potential to be my next favorite, like, comedy series, because this is about a spy that has to um, infiltrate this school and basically pretend that he is uh, a father to a child attending the school in order to um, get intel on this, basically, this authoritarian uh, leader uh, who whose son is also going to the school. Uh, but the problem is he doesn't have a family, so he has to invent one. So it's basically he enlists this child from the orphanage who's a telepath. And he also uh, gets this uh, woman uh, who is secretly an assassin to pretend to be um, his wife. Uh, but the fun part is that none of them know their real identity. It's the spy doesn't know that the child is a telepath or that the... Um, uh, or that his pretend wife is an assassin, and the wife doesn't know that he uh, that the man is a spy and the child is a telepath. The child knows who everyone is because she is a telepath, and it's just so much fun. It's kind of like Mr. and Mrs. Smith, uh, but make it make it sort of like domestic he, domestic lighthearted comedy and mix it mixed in with dark comedy. It's very uh, it has a lot of like situational absurd humor, which which I which I like. Um, the art style is pretty 
like it's serviceable. It's serviceable, but I don't I don't think that if you if you put Tatsuya Endo's drawings in a row with like similar artists doing similar things, I don't I don't think you would be able to like pick him out from the from the row. Um, but it's serviceable. It's the art is clean. Uh, the characters stay on model and they and they look fine. It's it looks fine. But to be honest. I don't think you would go for this series for the art anyway. It's all about the writing. It's all about the humor. And I think that the humor in this is also like... Like, it's an acquired taste. It's very, like, comedic and absurd. Also sort of dry. Like, there, there's some mix. Like, I, I think that if you like, like, British shows, like, for example, Red Dwarf, uh, and and some runs of Doctor Who, I think you would like this, um, I like this bang- manga. But I I think that the humor is what r- is is what really sells it uh, or breaks it for the reader. So yeah, I enjoyed it. I gave it three and a half stars. I have the next couple of volumes lined up for reading, so I'm really excited to be continuing on with this series. Moving on to the books that I read. The first one that I read was the second volume of uh, the Stories of the Raksura short story collections by Martha Wells. And I don't have a lot to say about this because it's more of the same. It's more it's more of the stories in the lives of the Raksura. It's about some, um, some domestic adventures. It's about... Um, like get giving points of view and some more voice for characters that haven't had a point of view in previous books and it was it was fine it was okay i will say that there was one short story that takes place in the in the roxura world but doesn't involve the roxura themselves and i just feel like um it it was an okay story, but I'm not really here for the other species and the other characters in the world. Like I I want to be with the Raksura. Those are the characters that I'm invested in. So I just thought that that short story in the collection was a little bit superfluous. Um, there was also one story about Moon. Uh, that I think was the first story in the book that I was like, it's okay, but it do- it didn't really give any new insight into Moon's character that we didn't already know previously. Um, uh, but there, the story that reveals the past of Indigo and Cloud, that was one of my favorites. So yeah, uh, I, I really enjoyed uh, that one. So I gave this short story collection three and a half stars and I still have two more books and then I'm finished with this entire series. But this has been like um, a really fun ride for me and I'm just really happy to have found this series because it's just so enjoyable, so uncomplicated and just escapism, which is much needed in these trying times. The next book that I read was Eva Evergreen, The Semi-Magical Witch by uh, Julie Abe. And I thought this was fine. This has been probably the least complicated middle grade book that I have read. Like, it explores some interesting themes about not comparing yourself to others, finding your own self-worth and finding your own unique abilities that that are unique to you and finding your own strength and finding ways to utilize your strengths even when others are putting you down. Um, It is about not comparing yourself to uh, basically like it is it is about trying to live up to uh, the high standards set upon you by parental figures who you view as being so awesome and amazing at what they do and realizing that you don't actually have to live up to those standards and that those standards 
uh, should not define you. Like those are really important themes that this book tackles. And they are more about, and, and the themes in this book are more about like internal conflict and internalized, like, um, like things that you internalize about yourself that I'm not good enough and, and I'm a troublemaker and I can't do this thing. Uh, instead of like broader topics about, for example, about race and sexuality, etc. So this is very internally focused. Um, and it is also like super just inclusive. There are there is uh, there is a side character who uses a wheelchair. Uh, there there are uh, a lot of basically the whole world is coded um, uh, coded Asian. So there is a lot of like uh, Asian representation, and uh, yeah, it's just very like easily approachable and digestible. If that makes sense, like it, it seems like I'm ragging on it, but I'm not. It was it was fun. It was such a quick and easy read, and just that you because you didn't really have to think about. Um, think about like all of these complex topics you could focus on like it has it has a narrow the book has a narrow focus on a single thing that it wants to address and it wants to address self-confidence in children and finding your own path and it does that very well so I gave it uh, four stars I really liked it and I want to continue on with the series so yeah. Then I read The Dark Fantastic Race and the Imagination from Harry Potter Through the Hunger Came Games by Ebony Elizabeth Thomas. That was a mouthful. Um, but I read, buddy read this with Shannon and it is a non-fiction academic, uh, basically uh, an almost dissertation about um, the ways in which... Um, authors write uh, black characters in fiction and uh, it's it was really interesting it basically offers you a toolkit to analyze and understand how these characters operate in their fictional settings and what what traps they tend to fall in to and uh, it was incredibly uh, fun to buddy read this with Shannon and to discuss all the topics with her uh, because I felt like I got a lot more out of this book by uh, being able to talk about each chapter in detail uh, with her. I wrote a ton of notes. Basically what I did was I listened to this on audio and then I had my notebook and I just at the same time as I was listening, I would write down notes. I think I wrote almost like 15 or 16 pages of notes from this book. So it was a very educational experience. I will say that this book covers uh, media from Hunger Games, both the books and the movies, and Harry Potter, um, The Vampire Diaries, and uh, BBC's Merlin. So you should, if you want to read this, you really should have at least a cursory knowledge of all of those, um, like, media uh, titles, so that you know what is being referenced. I, I, I feel like you can read this without that, but you won't get as much out of it. For example, I have never seen any episode of Vampire Diaries. I, I don't plan to. I haven't read the Vampire Diaries book, uh, books. So for me, that chapter gave me the least amount of, uh, of like usable information because I didn't have that knowledge base of the series to work with. Whereas the other, uh, other series I am familiar with in some way or another. So that's something to keep in mind if you do want to pick it up. It is also quite densely written. 
So I would say that this is one of those books that is perfect for a body read. And um, I would recommend this to people who want to um, delve more into media analysis and broaden their ability to critically read a text and possibly read a text with, um, with another viewpoint lens. Uh, and to take into consideration various aspects uh, pertaining to race when you read a book. So, yeah, I enjoyed this. Um, I gave it four stars and I would recommend it. Then, finally, I read Gideon the Ninth by Tamsin Muir. I finally have read this book. And what did I think about it? It was okay. It was okay. Like... This is a book that I feel splits people. You either love the writing style or you despise the writing style. Like, the, the writing style and authorial voice is a key element in this book why people probably dislike it. Like, if you can't get past the way Tamsin Muir writes and the way uh, her humor is, you won't like this book. I personally found that the humor was right up my alley. It's so stupid. Like, the humor in this book is so dweeby, dorky, and stupid. And that's basically me in a nutshell. So I was I was right here for the ride. Um, and also, I think... Um, another... Another crooks that people might have trouble with in this book is the huge cast of characters. Um, I'm not gonna lie, I am someone who usually doesn't have a huge trouble bet between differentiating a huge cast of characters, and I, I remember details pretty well. But I had to constantly be referring to the character list on the beginning of this book because I was like, okay, who who was who? Who who was who? There were some characters that were obviously not given enough page time, whereas others were very well fleshed out. Um so there is this bit of a misbalance between some of the characters. There are some who are like major characters and others who are who I don't even know why they were there besides to fill the numbers, I guess. But it was pretty obvious uh, to me that Tamsin Muir didn't really care about those characters either because she didn't include them in any scenes or really flesh them out in any way. Um, yeah, mm, it's, a, it's basically a book about Gideon, who is an orphan that was basically a kind of sort of adopted by the Ninth House of Necromancers. And she gets basically blackmailed by um, Harrow Hark, who is the essential master of the house, to go with her to these uh, tests to ascend to Lictorhood, which is basically like you will become an immortal necromancer. Uh, basically, you would ascend to a higher plane of existence. And uh, Harrowheart asks Gideon to go with her. Uh, and if Gideon agrees, she will basically ensure that Gideon gets to leave the Ninth House after, after they are done with the trials. And when they get there, things go to shit because people start appearing up, appearing dead, up, up dead. And, yeah, it's, it's an okay book. Like, I, I feel like I want to actually reread this at some point to see how well uh, Tamsin Muir actually foreshadows events in this book. Because at some, some points I was like, oh yes, this, this is a nice payoff from that previous thing that was established. But other things I was like, you sure about that? Are you sure that was well established? Hmm. So it's a bit of a mixed bag. Like, it's fun, it's entertaining, but also I don't think some things are well earned. I don't think some of the plotting works. And to be honest, 
I find Harrow Harks and Gideon's relationship, because this is kind of like an enemies to French sort of thing. I personally don't think that the way Harrow has treated Gideon and the way Gideon has treated Harrow, I don't think the culmination of that relationship is earned. Like, I, I'm not mad at it, but I don't think that it was earned. So I gave uh, Gideon the Ninth three stars. It was okay. I'm probably going to pick up Harrow, Har uh, Harrow, which is the second book from the library first, and then see if I'm going to continue on with the series and if I'm going to buy the rest of the books, because I do own this and it's beautiful and I'm not gonna unfold it. But yeah, three stars to Gideon. It was okay, but not a new favorite like I'd hoped. And the final book that I read in the month of February, and my favorite book of the month, is Black Sun by Rebecca Roanhorse. I am as surprised as anyone, because if you recall, I am not actually a huge fan of Rebecca Roanhorse's previous fair, which was The Trail of Lightning. I thought that it was kind of mediocre and just, you know, it does some interesting things with the urban fantasy tropes, but it's like, it wasn't my personal favorite. So I was kind of hesitant with Black Sun. I was hoping that it would live up to my expectations, but at the same time, I was kind of, um, he I was kind of hesitant because of my previous uh, experience with the author. And boy, was I proven wrong, because this book is friggin' magnificent. The character work, the subtle build-up of the world uh, through anecdotes in the big... Like, okay, here, okay. Whew, I, I'm gonna focus, focus my thoughts, focus my thoughts. Okay, so this book follows four POVs. And uh, it also follows two different timelines. And the way the POVs are distinguished from each other uh, in the chapters is that there are these anecdotes uh, that start up the chapter, that kind of flesh out the world. Similarly to what Robin Hobb does in, for example, the Farseer trilogy, each chapter begins like a little paragraph of like the history of the world. And this does a similar thing, but the history of the world is distinct for every character point of view. So it kind of, for example, in Shiala's chapter, uh, it focuses on like teak sayings and teak history because Shiala is a teak. And in Serapio's chapter, it focuses on the uh, Crow clan. In Naramba's chapter, it focuses on the sun god religion. And in Okoa's chapters, it focuses on, like, the war college, because that's where he is when we meet him. And that little, like, anecdote gives you insight into the world, and it also preps you to expect a shift in character voice. Uh, when you when you go into the chapter, and I, it's just the those kinds of small details that you don't really think about. Really, like I I like it so much, and there's a lovely like uh, build up between Shialas and Serapios like friendship. I I the. The relationship build-up and character work in this... It also feels like... Like, it, it has some very anime-esque moments, like this... Uh, this whole idea of Serapio learning from these different teachers, and uh, basically these mentors showing up, and there are these training montages, which are really... Uh, nicely done and it's just like it has that same sort of anime-esque vibe like for example that that you get from like Demon Slayer like Kimetsu no Yaiba and and um, Jujutsu Kaisen too it's like I don't know it's like this book shows you how a training montage can also give character development and also like 
I don't I don't really want to give too much away from away from the plot, but basically there is a major religious event happening. Uh, there is a solar eclipse that's happening in the sacred city of uh, Tova, and all these different players are heading there, and there may be a battle between two rival gods, and you just have to read to know more. My only gripe with this book, really, is the ending. And the the reason isn't really... Like, I just wanted a little bit more. Like, just a, just a teensy wincy bit more. Like, I'm actually really happy that... Because... Okay, folks, folks. The way the ending plays out in this book is just this amalgamation of... Like, it, it is a climax of everything that has been built up to up to that moment. So I am actually really happy that the ending doesn't uh, draw itself out. It, it happens quite quickly, and I... I personally feel that if it had drawn itself out more, it wouldn't have been as effective, because you see glimpses and foreshadowing toward that ending and toward that conclusion throughout the book. Um, but I will say that the very last chapter, I feel like, should have been a little bit longer, like, like maybe show a little bit more of the reaction of the people to the event that happened in the end. Uh, but other than that, uh, I thought that this was very well done and I really need the sequel and I loved this and I gave this four and a half stars. Um, yeah, I I feel like Rebecca Roanhorse is an author whose urban fantasy fair I might not like, but I really enjoy her take on epic fantasy. This was amazing. And there you have it. Those were all of the books that I read in the month of February. I know, this was... it was a lot. This was a long-ass video. I hope you enjoyed it nonetheless, and tell me in the comments which of these books and comics was your favorite. Um, have you read any of these? Do you want to read any of these? Let me know in the comments. And leave me a sun emoji down in the comments so that I know that you are here in honor of Black Sun. And I will see you in another video very soon. Bye-bye!